How's it going YouTube viewers? So I wanted to make a tutorial start to finish on how I built my Minecraft server. Uh, I've been working on this for quite a few days and I've had to watch numerous YouTube videos from several different creators to finally find all the information I needed to complete it. So I figure I would throw it all into one video. Uh, I'm not a professional. I'm not a computer programmer or a networking engineer. Um, I take no responsibility for whatever damage you do to your unit while doing this. Um, I'm showing you every step that I took start to finish and it worked for me. It worked perfectly. Um, I've reflashed and reflashed the unit several times just to make sure everything was good and it works for me. So um, if you follow this tutorial uh, diligently, it should work just as well for you. So we'll jump right into it. The items you're going to need for this project are your Chrome box, obviously a mouse, a paper clip or some sort of um, bobby pin or tool that you can uh, push the reset button on the Chrome box which, with, which you'll see uh, here shortly. This is a SIM removal tool for a cell phone. It works out, out pretty good. A small flathead screwdriver, a medium sized Phillips head screwdriver that can take out computer screws, and three USB drives. You're also going to need a keyboard and a monitor for the Chromebook as well. Okay, now we need to gather the software and the programs necessary to do this. So open your browser window and we're just simply going to Google this. The first program we're going to need is called Rufus. So Google Rufus and it should be one of the first ones that pops up here. The website is rufus.ie. Click that. Go ahead and download the most current version, which this version is 3.17. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and download that actually because it's updated from the one I have. So once it's downloaded, we're gonna go ahead and run it once and then exit out so that way it populates the files. And so now we have Rufus. Next, we're going to need this one here, which is Bitvice SSH. So, Bitvice SSH. Again, probably one of the first ones that pops up. It's uh, bitvice.com is the website. Go to their download section. You want to download the client app. So, click download, download it, and install it. So, those will probably be the only two programs that we need for this. Next, we need to get our software. So we're going to need a copy of Ubuntu server. So at the time of this video, the most current one is 20.04. So head on over to ubuntu.com in their download section, download Ubuntu server. So um, manual server installation is probably the one that you're going to want to pick. And then you can click this download section right here and that'll download an ISO. Uh, after you get that, go ahead and head over to Gparted and go to Gparted Download. Um, there's lots of sources to download this. All of them are pretty reliable. Just as long as you have one of the copies of Gparted, you should be fine. So go ahead and download that. And that should be about all we need for software. And I put everything in a file right here next to wherever I'm working that I can delete later if I don't want to keep them. But it just puts everything close together so that you can get to it easily. So now we need to go to the website where we're going to get our firmware utility script, which is from Mr. Chromebox.tech. A uh, shout out to Mr. Chromebox. He's the one that came up with all of this um, UEFI, Legacy Boot, all the firmware utilities that we need to convert our Chromebooks and Chromeboxes into regular computers and or Minecraft servers. So once you're here, go ahead and click on the firmware utility script page. And we're going to be needing these three lines right here. So just go ahead and keep this open. Uh, minimize it for now and then uh, we'll move into the next section where we create our USB sticks. So now you want to grab two of the empty USB flash drives that you need for this project. Go ahead and put one in. 
So as you can see, this is a formatted empty USB drive, which is what we want. Keep in mind, you're gonna lose any information that is saved on these. So go ahead and open Rufus. It'll ask for administrator privileges, just say yes. Top box, you wanna make sure that USB stick is the one selected. And then right here is where we wanna select our ISO. So go to select and go to the file that you created that has those two ISOs we downloaded in. And we'll do Gparted first. So double click Gparted. Uh, the rest of this information you don't really have to worry about. It does everything for you. Just go ahead and click start. And it'll come up with a bunch of boxes telling you that yes, you're gonna lose all your information. Are you sure you want to format this drive? Click yes to all of them and then just let it complete its task. So this will take about two minutes. So we'll go ahead and fast forward through this. Okay, now that that's completed, we can go ahead and close out of our app and eject your USB drive and insert your next one. Again, making sure it's an empty USB drive. Uh, we're gonna reopen Rufus again. Uh, make sure your USB drive is selected up here and not another drive that you don't want to format. Uh, select your ISO and this time we're gonna do our OS which is the Ubuntu live server. And click start. Go through the typical disclosures again. And then go ahead and let this run takes uh, another couple minutes and then we'll be back okay now our OS has been mounted to our USB flash drive so we'll go ahead and close Rufus and inject our USB drive there is one more a piece of software we need to download so open up your browser and head to minecraft dot oh, minecraft dot net slash download and we need to download this actual server software from minecraft so uh, once you get to this page scroll to the bottom click windows server and then on the right side it'll say the Ubuntu software. We need that, so go ahead and click download. I've already downloaded it into the file we created on our desktop, but it'll download a zip file. We need that for later, so go ahead and download that. And now we can head down to the desk to show you how to disable the BIOS write protection uh, for the Chromebox itself. Okay, so to be able to uh, rewrite the BIOS on a Chromebook, you have to disable the firmware write protection. Uh, on this particular Chromebox, it is a screw that connects uh, several terminals to the main board inside the unit. Uh, other Chromebooks and Chromeboxes have different methods of disabling the firmware write protection. Uh, this is how you do this one. Uh, I believe it is also the same on the Asus Chromebox as well. So what you'll need to do is flip your Chromebox over. Um, I've already taken the screws out of mine, but uh, there'll be four rubber feet in these areas. And you'll take your small flathead screwdriver and carefully pry up the rubber feet, which will expose four screws below the feet. Um, and they're labeled one, two, three, four. Uh, remove those screws. After you've removed those screws, carefully pry up the bottom casing uh, this piece of plastic just pops right out. There is no wires connected to it or anything like that, so you don't have to worry about damaging it. Um, set that off to the side for now. After you get that off, um, the Ace, Asus Chromebox doesn't have this metal framing in it, but this one does. Um, you'll also need to remove, there's five screws in total around this framing. You'll need to remove those. And then also this safety tape. I usually just peel one side up. You can cut it if you want. It's not really that big of a deal. Um, peel it up and carefully <laughs> open the framing. So on my Chromebook, it's going to be a little screw located just next to the Wi-Fi card. It's the screw that's kind of halfway off of the main board, 
halfway onto the main board. Um, I'll show a close-up picture of it so you can see what I'm talking about. It's not going to be the screws that are completely surrounded by the copper trays. It's going to be the screw that's halfway off, halfway on. Uh, we're going to go ahead and remove that screw. And once we remove it, we're going to toss it because we're never going to need it again. So once you have removed that screw, we are actually done inside the unit. So we'll go ahead and put it back together the way it came apart. This is also a good opportunity to upgrade your uh, RAM capacity if you wanted to do that. Uh, this particular Chromebox has 4 gigabytes of RAM, which is plenty to run a Minecraft server. Um, two would be plenty for probably up to five players in the server at once. If you plan on running more than five players, I would recommend going a little higher than two. Um, I've run a Minecraft server off of 4 gigabytes before with up to 20 players in it without any major, major issues. Pardon me saying um all the time, I'm not a professional YouTube editor or YouTuber or content creator. I'm just doing this because I know that I searched for hours and hours and hours trying to figure out how to do this with the Chromebox, searching many YouTube videos to try to figure it out, and I figure I would compile them all into one video for somebody who might need it. Try not to over tighten these screws either, they're very easy to strip. Alright, and on the HP Chromeboxes, the rubber feet are two different sizes. Um, you can tell by the recessed edges where they go. Um, if you're going to put them back in, make sure you put them back in the right spots. You don't really have to put these back in if you don't want to. They just keep it from sliding around on the desk. Alright, now that our chrome box is fully reassembled, we'll head into the next step, which is getting this bad boy in developer mode so that we can write our new firmware script to it. Okay, so I have all my peripherals plugged in, my screen, my keyboard, and my mouse. And I got it up on its side here because um, at this point we need to push the reset button on the chrome box which is located on the side it's a little tiny hole that you're going to use your sim tool or paper clip to um, push the button with so it's usually next uh, next to located next to sorry <laughs> the uh, k-lock um, outlet so on asus it's going to be on the top of the k-lock outlet and it's not going to be labeled on the hp it's next to it on the side and it is labeled reset we're going to need to do that so first we're going to need to boot into developer mode and by doing that we have to put our pin in there hold the button down while pushing the power button and as soon as the exclamation screen pops up on go ahead and release the reset button so now to put it in developer mode from this screen, you would push on your keyboard control and the letter D. It's going to ask you if you're sure you want to turn off, off OS or verification. Go ahead and get your uh, SIM tool out again. And to confirm this, we're just going to tap the button this time, not hold it down. So it'll come up and say OS verification is off, push space to re-enable, do not push space. Push control D again. So it'll reboot and come back to this screen and tell you that it's transitioning into developer mode. We're just going to leave it alone and let it do its thing. Uh, this can take in the upwards of 5 to 10 minutes. So we'll go ahead and fast forward through this section as well and come back after it has completed its job.
Alright, when it com finishes configuring developer mode, you'll see this screen. Um, don't push spacebar. Go ahead and push control D one more time. And it will boot up like it normally does into the Chrome setup screen. And we're going to go ahead and configure a few options in this screen, but not all. We're not going to log in. So when you see this, go ahead and click Let's Go, or whatever the button would be for next. And we're going to select our wireless network if you're using wireless. Uh, if you're using Ethernet, it'll probably bypass this screen completely. So. Type in my wireless password, connect my wireless. I always uncheck that. I don't know if it matters for this, but it is what it is. Click continue and it's going to do this checking for updates um, screen. This is actually a good thing because if you have a Chromebox or a Chromebook which is still allowing updates, then it will update to the current software, which is, um, uh, I don't know if it's good or bad, but it'll do it. So once you get to the sign in screen and you're connected to your internet, don't sign in. You don't need to. Uh, go to your keyboard and type Control Alt H. And that's going to pop up this screen, which asks if you would like to use this device for Hangouts. Um, go ahead and click No. And then do Control Alt F2. And that's going to bring us into our shell which is where we want to be. We want our command prompt for updating the firmware. So for the localhost login, it's just Kronos, which is the login for Chrome OS. And uh, once you see this, now we're going to head back over to Mr. Chromebox, which is the website that we pulled up earlier. And we're going to use those lines of code. I'll go ahead and flash a picture of it right now so that you can pause and um, screenshot it or do whatever you need to do so that you have that code on hand. Alright, so the first line we're going to type in is this line right here. CD curl dash L O Mr. Chromebox dot tech slash firmware dot oh firmware dash UTIL dot SH and push enter. So this should download the firmware utility file that we need. Um, if you get an error right here where it asks for an SSL certificate then you need to go down to the very bottom step on this page for Mr. Chromebox and follow these instructions to do it. Uh, some of these Chromeboxes are locked with an SSL certification. Uh, some of them aren't. Uh, mine in particular is not, but I have run into this issue before. So follow these steps if it comes up with an SSL error at this point. If it does not, we're going to move on to the next step, which is typing in the second line which is sudo install dash capital D lowercase t and uh, this this command line is very sensitive to spaces and capitals so make sure you type it in exactly how it's shown on the website and then we're going to give it its directory dash n755 So if you didn't type anything in right, it'll give you an error at this point. If it, you do get an error, just start over from the top line and retype everything in and make sure you're typing it in correctly. And now we'll move to the third line, which is the actual install of the firmware. Sudo, su, sudo firmware dash util dot sh push enter and then just go ahead and let it run um, this part it doesn't take 
an extreme amount of time, but it will take a couple minutes before you get to the firmware screen. Okay, now we're on our firmware screen. This is where we're going to install the UEFI firmware we need to run our Ubuntu OS. Um, so you need to select UEFI, which is option number two, and push enter. Uh, it's going to tell you that flashing the firmware will remove your ability to run Chrome OS, um, possibly void your warranty if you still are within warranty. Um, if you agree, push yes, or push Y for yes, enter. Um, this is telling you that you won't have an OS after this, so you'll need to install an OS. Push yes for continue. Um, this part isn't extremely important if you don't ever plan on using this uh, device for Chrome OS again, but I personally like to keep um, these files on hand just in case I ever do want to revert it back to Chrome OS if I'm going to sell it or whatever. So at this point we're going to take our third USB drive, which is uh, empty still at this point, and go ahead and plug it into one of your USB ports of the Chromebox. And we're going to click yes because we're going to create a backup of the stock firmware that came on the Chromebox. Push yes. Select one for the USB stick which we just inserted. And there we go. So we have now saved a file of our stock firmware just in case we ever want to revert back. And go ahead and remove that USB stick, put it in a safe place, and push enter to continue. So now we're installing the UEFI firmware. Uh, probably fast forward through this section as well, and then we'll move on to our OS install. Okay, so once the uh, firmware has been flashed, it'll display press enter to return to the main menu at the bottom. Go ahead and push enter. And at this point, we want to push P and power down the unit completely. All right, at this point, we need to partition the hard drive to accept our OS. So grab your uh, USB stick that you put G-parted on and insert it into one of the USB ports and power on the system. The BIOS load screen will pop up and say push escape to get to the menu, so make sure you push escape within the time frame. Go down to boot menu and select your USB drive. And this will boot into Gparted. So um, most of the options are going to be pre-selected here. Um, you can watch them just to make sure you're selecting the, the right options, but you want to do the first one which is Gparted Live. And the, the time on this will differ depending on the speed of your USB stick. Um, this particular USB flash drive I'm using is actually pretty slow. Now when you get to this screen, I would just recommend saying don't touch the key map. The key map is exactly where it needs to be. So here you select your language that you want to display Gparted in. and this one you want to start Gparted automatically, so make sure it's on selection 0 or just push enter if 0 is already in there. And this will boot into the graphical interface for Gparted. So once you're at this screen, just give it a second and it'll boot up into the partition window. So now we want to delete everything in this window. Um, first off, you actually want to make sure you're on the right drive. So up here in the right corner, you have SDA and SBD. SBD, more often than not, is the flash drive. We don't want to delete that. We want to be on SDA, which is the internal SSD of the Chrome box. So all of these need to be deleted. These are the partitions for Chrome OS, and we want one solid partition. So just click on each individual one that doesn't say unallocated, and hit the delete button on your keyboard. And this is the end result you want to see. Um, 
however big your SSD is, you want to see 14 gigabytes of unallocated space. And then after you've done that, click the green check mark and apply. And it'll delete all of those partitions and make one solid unallocated partition. Click close, go to quit, and double click exit. It'll take a second, but it'll pop up, and now we're going to go back to shut down again and completely power down the unit. Now we're going to take and remove RG parted flash drive and insert our Linux Live server um, flash drive that we made, the one with the OS on it. Go ahead and put that in and power on the unit. And now push escape when you get the boot menu. And, or the BIOS menu and then go down to boot menu and USB the USB stick that you created whatever yours might be named and then we're gonna install Ubuntu server which is the first option and it's gonna run through some random lines of code and it'll take a couple minutes and then it'll come up to the first install screen Right here where it says CD-ROM fail, uh, just ignore that. This unit doesn't have a CD-ROM drive on it and from what I've found in my experience that no matter what machine you install this on, it always says that at first. And I, I don't really know why, it doesn't really apply to us so we're going to ignore it. Now we're on our Ubuntu install screens, so the first thing we're going to do is pick English or whatever language that you'd like to set your server to be in. Mine's English. Um, here's where we pick our internet connection. Now if you're connected to Ethernet, it'll already depopulate it up here for your IP address. Um, if it recognizes your uh, wireless LAN card right away, um, that's good. Sometimes it takes a couple minutes for the wireless LAN card to pop up right here. So just let it sit on the screen for a minute. It should populate your wireless card. Once it has, go up to it and select it and go to edit Wi-Fi. And now I'm going to connect it to my home's Wi-Fi. Go down to password, type in your password, whatever it may be. And then go to save. And now we're going to wait for it to grab an IP address from the router. And there we go, we have our IP address, we're connected to the internet. Go down to done, continue to the next screen. Um, I always ignore this, it doesn't really apply to what we're doing for this project, so we're going to skip that. We're going to skip that. And this one, you want to make sure that um, this screen pops up and it says use entire disk. Um, if you didn't do the G parted section of this tutorial correctly, it won't say this right here and it'll want you to pick a specific partition to install the OS on. Um, we don't want that. We want to use the entire SSD for our Ubuntu server. We don't just want to use a small partition because that's where our server is going to be running as well. So make sure it says entire disk and that it lists your SSD there. And if it does, go to done. Um, if it doesn't, go back to the previous step in this video about the G parted section so that you can delete all of the Chrome OS partitions and make one solid partition. Uh, we're gonna go to continue on this screen. And here we wanna pick our name. Uh, you can put whatever you want. I just put my name, server name. Uh, we'll go uh, MC HP server, Minecraft HP server. Uh, username, pick whatever you want, same with password, whatever password you want. Make sure this is a password that you can remember because you will be typing it in several times throughout the life of this Minecraft server. Now this is an important part right here. Make sure you click install open SSH server. Um, I uh, take this server and I actually go and stick it in a cabinet next to my router. I don't have it actively out on a desk with a screen on it all the time 
and um, we're going to end up using our SSH client that we downloaded earlier to get into this server to to uh, change files and activate the server and that's how you're going to access this server most of the time unless you decide to keep it hooked up to a screen and a keyboard all the time that's totally up to you um, I would still recommend installing this because it makes it very easy to transfer Minecraft files onto the server uh, from your Windows computer so once you do that this don't mess with any of this you'll break it just tab over to done and then now it's going to go through the install process and this is going to take approximately 10 minutes to finish um, once it's finished it'll say reboot now at the bottom of it it's also going to go through and download whatever necessary ubuntu updates are available so we're just going to let this go and fast forward to the next section of the tutorial Okay, at this point, um, uh, my recording messed up, but I didn't get at the bottom where it said reboot now. But once it says reboot now on the bottom line, go ahead and uh, scroll down to it, tab down to it, and, and reboot your system now. And uh, when it reboots up, it's going to look like this. Um, at this point, um, you've removed your Ubuntu install USB as well it'll actually tell you that it'll say please remove install media push enter and then it'll go into a reboot and it'll do all of this that it's doing now and uh, this will take a couple minutes uh, what you want to do is you just want to let it do its process just walk away from it come back to it later after it's been sitting idle for a while and no more lines are scrolling up on the screen we'll pick up from that point Okay, after uh, your server is done booting, it's been sitting idle for a couple minutes, uh, it may show this or it may show a few lines of code. Whatever the case, just push enter and then type in your username that you created earlier in the setup screen and the password that you created. Now, as you type in this password, the keystrokes are not going to be registered. It's just going to continue with the flashing line. Um, they are being recorded. Just type it in correctly and push enter, and it should bring you to this screen. Um, just a basic screen shows you the current temperature of your CPU, um, how many processors you have, etc., etc. So, uh, first thing we need to do is we need to make sure our system is completely up to date and current. So to do that, you would type in sudo apt update. Type in your password one more time, and it will check for current updates. Um, I will flash these uh, lines of code across the screen so that you can see what I'm typing in a little bit clearer. So it says that we have 29 packages that can be upgraded. So we want to do that, so we're going to type in sudo apt upgrade and it asks us do we want to upgrade we're gonna click yes and then we're gonna play the waiting game again so it's gonna do this for a few minutes and update all the necessary packages that it needs to run properly so we'll fast forward through this one as well and we'll be right back all right, so all of our packages have been updated at this point, so we need to perform a system restart. Uh, we are going to type the command sudo shutdown now dash r, r is for restart. And it's going to go through the same process that you've been seeing this whole time, uh, lines code up and down. Um, we're going to go back into our system booting again which will take a couple minutes, so back to the fast forward reel. Okay, and now we're booted back up and ready to re-log in. So to re-log in, same thing as before, push enter, type in your username and your password. 
and at this point we need to install a program called unzip so that we can unzip the bedrock server file we downloaded from Minecraft earlier. sudo apt install whoop, in, install unzip and this will only take a, a few seconds to fully install and just to make sure that everything is up to date with that program as well we're going to go sudo app update just to check uh, more than likely it's all up to date yeah all packages are up to date so we are good to go so now we are going to go back over to our windows 10 computer and we are going to ssh into this using our bitvice program we downloaded um, we can do everything from command line on our windows pc at that point we don't need to use the server screen to do it it also helps for copying and pasting and and whatnot so i'm gonna head back over there oh yeah so before we do that we need to figure out what our ip address is so to do that you type in ip space a and under our wireless card if you look there wlp2so is my wireless card my ip address is 10.0.0.97 so we're going to need to remember that so let's head back over to our windows pc at this point so now what we need to do is we need to go to our bitvice client that we had uh, downloaded earlier we're going to open that up and it's going to look something like this so right here in the host address, we need to type in that IP address that we just remembered, 10.0.0.97. Uh, by default, the SSH port in the server is 22. Um, you can change that if you would like for more secure access in the future. There are plenty of YouTube videos out there on how to do that. So I'm not gonna go into that in too in depth. Um, over here on the right, our username, type in the username you created and the password that you created. Um, uncheck this, enable password over KBDI. Uh, we don't need that for this application. So once you've typed in all of that, go ahead and go to the bottom here and click login. It's gonna ask you to accept the host change, blah, 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 blah. Just click accept and save. So at this point, we are now logged in. Oh, no, we're not, because the password's wrong. As soon as I figure out life. Okay. Now we're logged in. So once you're logged in, you'll see a couple new options pop up here on the left. Uh, we have a terminal console where we can open up. It looks just like what we saw on the um, server screen. Um, SFTP is for file transfers. So this is actually a graphical interface of the file system of the server. So these are the current files that are saved under the user file in the home directory of the root of the server. Don't ask any questions, it's complicated. But this is mainly what we're gonna be working with the most. So now that we have our SFTP window open, we are gonna right click and create a folder. Um, this is where our Minecraft server files are gonna be stored. And we're just gonna call it Minecraft. So after we have created our Minecraft folder, go ahead and open it up with a double click. And then head over to your files folder that you had created earlier. So now we're going to take our bedrock server um, zip file that we downloaded and we're going to just drag it over and copy it into the SFTP window and once the bar has completed down here at the bottom you can go ahead and close out of this and open up your terminal window again so now we need to tell the server to navigate to that file which we just cre created um, so to do that we would type in CD Minecraft and if you just type in like the first two letters like MI and hit tab it'll auto populate because that is currently the only file that is in that directory so CD MI tab enter now we're in that file so now we need to unzip 
the bedrock file we just transferred. So to do that, type in unzip and then BED, hit tab, and it'll auto populate it, push enter. And this will unpack all of the files that are within that zip file. All right. Once that's done, we need to make this folder executable so that we can launch our server when we want. And to do that, the command is chmod space plus sign space the star key and push enter. So now at that point, our file is executable. So if we go back over into our SFTP client, we can open up the Minecraft server uh, file and we see that we have a bunch of new files here. First off, we need to get rid of this zip file. We no longer need it, so just select it and hit delete. So before we launch our server, there are a few tweaks we can make to it um, through this file right here called server properties. So to edit these kind of files, what I use, um, you can use just regular notepad that comes with Windows if you'd like. Um, first, let's drag this over to our desktop so we can copy. Oh, I already have one over there. So let's let's reopen our files folder and we'll drag it into our files folder so it'll take a second to download and once it's fully downloaded you'll see server properties right here so you can uh, right click it and go down to open with and then notepad if you want and it opens up this which is all the uh, minecraft server options you can edit it in this if you'd like i don't like using this um, i prefer to use notepad plus plus which if you uh, felt it necessary to download it you can just google it notepad plus plus hit enter go to their download section download the newest release um, this one is a little bit better for writing scripts and writing code for stuff like this so I will go down and edit with Notepad++. And when it opens, it'll look like this. So these are all of our server options. Up here is the server name. You can name it whatever you want. So we'll call it tutorial server. And your game mode. There's uh, three different game modes you can pick, survival, creative, adventure. You would simply type in what you want right here. Just delete survival and type creative or whatever. But we're going to leave it in survival for this uh, force game mode. Um, it explains everything right here below it, what it does. I always leave this on false. Um, that inhibits the ability of other players changing the, the game mode in game. Uh, difficulty level, peaceful, easy, normal, or hard. Uh, allow cheats, like if you want to be able to use teleport or use the give command inside the game, um, you would change this to true, and that allows you to use cheats if you want to use cheats. Um, Self-explanatory here, max players, you can pick however many players you want. Um, this particular chrome box is a four gigabyte it is fully capable of running 20 or even maybe even more players um, so we can change that to 20 if we want uh, online mode leave that in true that way other people can remotely connect to your server through your home internet if you want to play a friend that's not near you a whitelist uh, that is to allow only specific players in your server um, I always put this to true so that we don't get any trolls in there that want to overload your server. And I'll show you how to add a player to the whitelist after we're done here. A server port, the default ports are 19132 or um, 25565. Those are the default Minecraft server ports. I would definitely recommend changing this to a different server port um, just so that again you don't have 
trolls that want to come in and hack your server. Uh, the, the good thing about this is you're using this system specifically as a dedicated Minecraft server, so it's not like you're going to lose any personal information or files. Um, I definitely wouldn't save any personal information or files to the server specifically for that reason, but just to be safe, change this to whatever you want to change it to. Um, for the purposes of this video, we'll leave it at 19132. Um, yeah, you can just go through this and, uh, I mean, read the descriptions about what the different options are. You can change it to whatever you'd like. Um, this is your world name. And um, there is actually a way that you can transfer your your personal world that you've already played, your single player world, on your Minecraft game into the server so that other people can play it. Um, the downfall on that, though, is once you do that, you're going to spawn elsewhere from wherever you created your village or your house or whatever it is um, so keep that in mind you're gonna have to refind all of your stuff when you spawn into the server once you transfer your world over into it and I will I'll go through that as well on how to transfer your world um, I'm not gonna go too much more in depth other than creating the server just because this video will end up being a million years long if I do a uh, level seed you, you have to put something in here or the world won't load, so I always put one, two, three. It doesn't really matter, honestly, uh, what number you put in there. Just put one, two, three. Default player permission level. Um, anybody who enters your server, this is what they're going to enter as. Uh, member is the most common one. That way they can interact with blocks, they can build, they can cut trees down, they can mine. Um, you don't want them to be an operator because then they have access to commands and teleporting and everything else. Um, you can make individual operators in the server. So I would recommend leaving this at member or even putting it at visitor. If you put them at visitor though, they can't interact with blocks. Uh, texture pack, if you load texture packs into your server world, uh, you change this to true and then you load them into the texture pack file in the SSH client or the SDFP client that we loaded earlier this right here so under Minecraft you have resource packs behavior packs uh, you can load those into those files and then you'd have to go and change this to true um, same with the rest of them but uh, the rest of these options I would just leave them alone they're good the way they are unless you know what they are and you don't want to ruin your server just leave them alone so once you've created that file go up here to click save very important that you click, click save. Even if you're in Notepad, uh, Microsoft Notepad, still save. Uh, we can exit out of Notepad++ at this point. And now we're going to go back into our SFTP window, where our files were, where we originally grabbed our server properties. Um, and now we're going to take our server properties file that we just edited and drag it back in going to pop up with this asking if you want to overwrite it. Click overwrite. So we want to overwrite the original server properties that were loaded. So at this point we can launch our bedcraft server or bedrock server sorry. I mean it's 2.35 in the a.m. here so I'm kind of tired. But to do that so we're going to open up our terminal window again and to launch the server, you have to type in period forward slash, type in BED tab, and it will preload it. Press enter. So now you've launched your server. Your server is currently active. You could log into it right now and play it. Um, if you go back into your STV, SFTP client, you can see that it populated a bunch of more files here. So we're not going to log into the server just yet. We're going to stop the server by typing stop. Now that our server has generated these files, we can do a few more edits. So if you wanted to add your Minecraft world from Windows into the server so that you and friends can play it over the server and your friends could log into the server and play it when you're not there, um, you would simply go to wherever your Minecraft world is stored. On Windows, if you push the Windows key and R, 
and you type in this right here percentage local app data percentage press OK it opens this file go to packages and then search through here under the Microsoft files and you'll see Microsoft UWP Minecraft might take you a second to find it but you should be able to find it somewhere in here oh, yeah, there it is right there Minecraft UWP double click that go into local state games com.mojang and then minecraft worlds right here so I don't have any minecraft worlds in mine I play mostly on servers so but right here you'll have a couple of files and they'll be weird names they'll be like ZJWP295W or something like that um, if you open the file up there'll be a, an image file in there double click the image and that image is the last place you were when you saved your world so you know what world it is at that point so what you would do is go into the worlds folder on your ST, SFTP client click your world up here the weird named one and drag it down over into here let it finish copying once it's copied you can name it whatever you want just by right clicking on it and going to rename and the world whatever you want it to be called so once you've renamed it though what you have to do is copy that name and go back into your server properties open your server properties in notepad plus plus again and scroll down to where is it at? Where are you at? Where are you at? Where are you at? Where are you at? Scroll down to level name right here. You need to change this to whatever you named that folder in your SFTP client. So you would need to change this to the world or whatever you called it. Because that tells the server to load that file rather than the file it created when you started the server. So now that that is all done and set up and ready to go I like to give my server one last restart just to make sure everything is as it should be and so to do that we would need to exit out of all of this log out of uh, Bitvice you can leave this window open because we'll use it again and then we're gonna head back over to our server uh, server screen now that we're back on our server screen, it's a simple command, sudo shutdown now dash r. Hit enter, type in your password. So it's going to go through the restart uh, process again, and uh, when it comes back up, we'll head back over to our Windows PC. Okay, so our server has finished its restart procedure and we're back on Windows in our Bitvice SSH client and we're gonna log back in and we're gonna type in the correct password this time and once we're in we're gonna open up terminal and just like before we're gonna CD into our Minecraft folder and we're gonna type at, at this point there's a specific step you have to do so um, if you ever decide to shut the server off, you need to stop it correctly so that way the server can save the Minecraft world, stop all of the procedures for Minecraft, and then you can shut the actual unit off itself. But to do that without keeping this window open nonstop, otherwise you'd have to keep your SSH client open all the time. Um, if you don't want to do that, just type in screen. Comes up, tells you what it's all about. This basically saves your current state so you can go back and stop your server later so go ahead and start your server with period forward slash bed tab enter so now our server is up and going on port 19132 so we can actually open minecraft now 
and log into our server and check it out. So once Minecraft comes up, go ahead and click play, servers, and scroll all the way to the bottom. And you want to add server. So the server name can be whatever you want it to be. This part doesn't matter. Name it whatever you want. And then your server IP address is going to be the IP address that you typed into your SSH client, which is 10.0.0.97. And the port number is set as the default, but you would, here you would enter the port number that you picked in the server properties when we edited them. Um, if you want to connect, um, if you want a friend to connect to your server via the internet, you would enter your public IP address in right here and you'd have to activate port forwarding on your router. There are tons of YouTube videos out there that are really good about how to activate port forwarding. Uh, I'm not gonna go into that part here. It's super easy. Um, it's nothing really you have to worry about. I guarantee my router is different than your router for activating port forwarding, so I don't really wanna go into it because it's probably gonna be different than what you do anyways. But um, you need to activate port forwarding to the port that you picked to the IP address of your server in your router settings. Go ahead and look up a YouTube tutorial on how to do that. Uh, but if you're accessing it from the same network that your computer is connected to, i.e. your home Wi-Fi, then this is what you would type in. Go ahead and click play. Now you're going to get this message at first. You're not invited to play on this server. And that's because we activated the whitelist. The whitelist only allows certain players into your server. So go back to your terminal window and to add a player to the whitelist so that they can get into your server, type in whitelist, add, and then the player's name exactly how it, it, it appears on their Microsoft account or their Mojang account or whatever it is it is case sensitive so you click that hit enter now that player has been added to the whitelist you have to add yourself as well and you can do that for as many players as you want adding them to the whitelist uh, to remove them from the whitelist it's simply whitelist remove and then their player name again and then they're removed so we're going to add me back in so i can get into the server I'm on the whitelist now. So now we go back to our Minecraft window and the server that we just typed in should be saved there. Go ahead and click it and click join server. And on our terminal window you can see it says player connected. So the first time you log in to the world it's going to take a couple minutes because it has to generate absolutely everything in the world um, after the after this point though it should just come right in real quick every time so there you go you are now playing on your new minecraft server that you just made so the world populates a little slow but once it's populated it's actually pretty cool it's pretty fun um, you can log into this from anywhere with your public ip address uh, your friends can come and play when you're not around if you want to have it that way um, yeah so you can do with with this whatever you want there are add-ons you can install um, all kinds of stuff so at this point uh, you went in as a member which is the star so you don't have access to change any world settings or anything like that you can't use commands like teleport nothing comes up because you're not an operator. So you have to op yourself. To do that, you have to go back to your terminal window and just type op and your player name. See, in the Minecraft window, I'm an operator now. So now I can use teleport, teleport me, or I can use the give function. I can give me a diamond. There you go, I have a diamond now. So once you're an operator, you have access to commands and everything else, and so on and so forth. But yeah, that is how you do it. 
so now we're going to save and quit. And exit out of Minecraft. So now, disconnect from your SSH client, and I'm going to show you how you go back in to shut the server down if you would want to. So say it's been a week, you want to shut the server down for a while, you're going on vacation, whatever the case may be. Um, go back to your um, Bitvice SSH client, open it back up. Um, all your information should be saved in there still. So just go in and log in. Open up a terminal window. And to get back to that server screen so that you can stop your Minecraft server, you type in screen dash R for resume. Bam. Brings it right back up. Stop your server with stop command. There you go, everything stopped. And to shut your server down, you type in sudo shutdown now. Type your password. And there you go, disconnected. Your Chromebox should have shut off now. You're good to go on vacation. Thanks a lot for watching this tutorial, guys. I really appreciate the views and any feedback you might have. If you have any questions about this or if you think I might have left something out, don't hesitate to leave a comment below. Uh, I'm not a famous YouTuber, so I usually get back to people who comment on my videos pretty quickly. Um, yeah, and also if there's anything you want to add to it or anything that you think uh, might be available for it, just Google it, YouTube it. There's lots of stuff you can do with Minecraft servers out there. The idea behind me doing this is just to start to finish Minecraft server creation out of a Chrome box because I haven't seen any videos out there that show you start to finish on this type of thing. I've had really good luck with these servers. I got a couple of them going in my house for me and my, my friends and my siblings to play on. And we absolutely love it. It works great. Um, I haven't had any issues with it going over Wi-Fi, but I do have pretty fast internet speed at my house. So if you are finding that your server is glitching or you have pixelation uh, worse than Minecraft already comes with, uh, I would recommend connecting it to an Ethernet connection. Um, you should probably plug your screen into it when you do that because your IP address for the server will change at that point and you will need that for your SSH client. So yeah, any questions or comments, leave them below. Thanks for watching. Have a great day, guys.